and it tells you when you hover over it the purpose. This is another reason for using the graphical environment. If you want to be able to switch between normal and daylight savings time, then set your system clock to use UTC and allow the operating system to modify it accordingly. Let's set a password for administrator and proceed with the installation. We'll click on next and this will retrieve installation information. We'll ignore these groups because again we'll be reinstalling the system momentarily. Again our intent here is to focus on RAID 5 deployment for the root file system and later on we'll be looking at logical volume management. So as far as partitioning is concerned we've looked at the default layout which provides a very large root file system and a swap partition. We've also looked at custom partitioning where we laid out separate var home swap root and boot mount points on different file systems using the VMware instance and now we're looking at software RAID RAID 5 to be exact which allows us to achieve greater performance by striping the data, the reads and the writes across multiple disks and also include a, to improve our redundancy by making the data available in the event of failure of one of the disks. Not one or more, but one. RAID 5 can sustain the failure of one disk, one and only one disk. If you need to be able to sustain the failure of more than one disk, then you'll want to look at perhaps RAID 10, which will allow you to sustain two disks or more depending on the way you've configured the RAID 10 set. But as far as RAID 5 is concerned, one disk failure will be sustained. And for most environments, the failure of one disk or the ability to sustain the failure of one disk is sufficient as usually disks don't fail that often. So dependencies are being resolved and momentarily we'll be off to the copy process which will get through quickly and once the system's up and running we'll enumerate the file systems to be sure that software RAID is in place. Just like with the text-based installation it tells us that beneath the root directory a file named install.log will be created as well as anaconda-ks.cfg. Again for subsequent installations if you want to use kickstart rename anaconda-ks.cfg to ks.cfg, publish this file on an accessible location like a floppy disk, CD-ROM, or out on an HTTP server, and then start your installation using either the boot.iso, which ultimately allows you to connect to a network source, or using the DVD or one of five from the CD set, and then specify Linux KS equals and the location of the ks.cfg file, and that will allow you to kickstart the installation and hopefully take you through a totally hands-free installation. And by hopefully we mean if all of the options have been specified, all of the answers to the questions that are going to come up during installation have been specified in the kickstart file, then there should be no reason to prompt the user or prompt you for input. So the file system is being formatted. Keep in mind it's 40 gigs, but RAID partitions tend to format fast because the information is spread across multiple disks. In this case, across three disks. So whenever the format or writes are taking place, the operating system quickly spreads the information to three disk heads as opposed to one. And whenever operating with more disks, performance will always be faster as you have more heads operating simultaneously which explains why the 40 gigabyte space is being formatted so quickly. The install process is starting and we should be off to the races momentarily. So again, just to recap, the way you take care of the RAID during installation is to clean your partition table slate unless you can't afford to lose information for another operating system or you're upgrading from an older version of Red Hat or some other Linux variant and you can't afford to lose data but you need to secure in the case of RAID 5 at least three software RAID partitions of whatever size as long as there's a common size so let's say you need to allocate 20 gigabytes per disk then 
secure that space, turn them into software RAID partitions. Once you have the three software RAID partitions, either on the same disk, which isn't recommended, or across multiple disks, then you create a RAID device. So it's software RAID partitions, then RAID device. Once you've got that first RAID device, which will be located beneath the dev tree as MD0, so forward slash dev forward slash MD0, then you can overlay a file system mount point and you do so by allocating a mount point such as root, boot. In the case of boot, however, it must be on a RAID 1 volume. So it will be root or var or home, opt, etc. And once you've got that in place and you've created your swap partition as well as your boot partition or your boot mount point, you can then move on with the installation. Optionally, you can rate everything. You can create two software RAID partitions of a small size of 100 megabytes each, create a RAID 1 set, a mirrored set, So, and that will be device MD0, for example. So dev MD0 could be two software RAID partitions of 100 megabytes each, which means you'll ultimately have 100 megabytes, but it will be rated at least, and it will be mirrored. Then create a second RAID set, which will be labeled or listed as dev MD1, make that RAID 5, and then associate the different mount points to different chunks of dev MD1. And then you'll be up and running once installation proceeds. So we'll let this elapse and pop in momentarily to see where we are and then finish up the installation. And well, now we're finishing up the installation. So most of the files have been copied. The bootloader is being installed. And now we're ready to reboot the system and peruse the software RAID configuration. And now we're rebooting, and we should be up to the start menu momentarily after the hard drives have been detected. We'll just ensure that the boot ISO CD has been ejected from the server, otherwise it'll cause it to boot, unless of course we disable the booting of the CD-ROM, reorder it of course, that's an option. Now the disk drive backplane is being searched, and whatever is found will be detected and reported. Pixie boot. Here's the primary boot menu, the grub menu, and as we've done before with respect to the grub password, in order to make changes we have to press P to indicate the password, and then the proper password, which will allow us to make changes. Otherwise, it won't allow us to make changes. Now we'll edit again, just to avoid the whole startup routine, having to fill out the forms, we'll edit the kernel startup by using the E option and indicating single. The kernel reads all of the options that you see here, including the location of the kernel, where the root device is located, on DevMD0, with other settings. We'll press enter, then B to boot. And we'll be up in single user mode momentarily. And now we're booting. Universal device is, or UDEV is being started. And now we're in single user mode. This is the shell for single user mode, sh-version. So we're in, we can interact, and the key thing is to take a look at the partition layout. We'll clear screen and then execute a df-h. h returns the output in human readable format. And there you see the root partition, forward slash, is assigned to dev mb0, which is the RAID partition. It's almost 40 gigabytes, of which 1.9 gigabytes are in use. 35 is free. 35 gigabytes are free. And SDA, SDA1 is assigned to boot, so it's independent. An LSL of dev MD0 will reveal the dev entry. Dev MD1 reveals no such entry because we didn't create another entry. Well, of course, the utility is once you're up and running to manipulate the RAID layout. We'll look at those later on when we make use of some of the space that's available. But we're up with the RAID 5 configuration, albeit with a large partition root. Next, we're going to look at LVM, Logical Volume Management, during installation. So let's go ahead and reboot the system.